right, well, welcome to the Hermes podcast, brought to you by LinkedIn, given that that's where I met all of oh, you. Right. Um, that's right. But uh, yeah, this is the first, uh, first morning podcast recording I've ever done. So hopefully you've all gotten enough rest today to have a nice uh, energetic discussion. Um, but uh, hey, everybody, AJ, uh, CEO, one of the co-founders here at Hermius. Uh, very excited to sit down and chat this morning with, uh, honestly, three of our earliest supporters, like three of the people who were like, yeah, I, I believe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, but uh, I, I won't steal the thunder. Uh, I'll, I'll pass the mic around uh, to Rob, Rob, and Keith to uh, introduce themselves, share a little bit about uh, about their background, so so everyone's got uh, some context as to uh, kind of where you've where you've been in, in your careers, um, where you are today, and then uh, we'll you know take a, a little bit of a journey back in time uh, in, in terms of uh, how you guys came to uh, came to be supporting us here at Hermes. So, All Rob, right. yep. Thanks, AJ. Rob Meyerson. I'm an advisor to Hermes and a uh, longtime space exec uh, with experience at NASA <coughs> and uh, in the commercial industry, including Blue Origin. Um, and been an advisor to Hermes since maybe the day after I left Blue Origin. I think that's probably when you called me. So uh, emailed me on LinkedIn. So, yep. <laughs> yep. Over to the other Rob. Yep. Rob Weiss. Um, you know, you bring up a LinkedIn. Uh, I'll never forget the day you, you and I talked on the phone. We caught up on via LinkedIn, and uh, I had just retired from uh, 34 years at Lockheed Martin, um, running the Skunk Works was my last job. So you, I believe, thought I had some relevant uh, capability to offer to what you're doing, um, and it's been it's been a good ride. Uh, in addition, to my 34 years at Lockheed, I spent 10 years uh, on active duty in the Navy, flying carrier jets, and uh, and then uh, stayed in the reserves after that while I was working at uh, at Lockheed. Did a lot of different things during my time in the aeronautics business, including uh, our initial activities on the hypersonics. So it's been a been a good time at. Uh, at Lockheed Martin and in the Navy. And uh, since I retired, I've been dabbling in a few different things, including the activity with Thermia. So look forward to the conversation today. Cool. So Keith Masbach, I've got about 30 years in the national security business between uh, being active duty as an army officer in the infantry and military intelligence, uh, and then a government senior executive, both on the army staff and at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and then um, 10 years at the United States Geospatial Intelligence Foundation. And for the last few years, all starting with Hermes, really, I've uh, been doing advising, consulting, and angel investing uh, for startups, kind of in this geospatial intelligence and related fields. So um, that LinkedIn connection for me as well uh, uh, was really important. Uh, a, re a really important milestone in, in my professional career. Yeah. So just a uh, kind of question for the group. What put us in your mind space when you first got a random note from this guy from Georgia talking about really fast airplanes. I remember what you wrote. You, you said, Rob, you're known for your badassery. And I said, <laughs> Whoa, that, that is the first <laughs> time i've ever Badass heard anyone it. use that word in a sentence so he's worth talking with <laughs> that stood out you know i, I don't remember <clears throat> the uh, actual note you sent me but i i had just as i said earlier re retired from lockheed and you, you know anytime you're working a full-time job it's 24 7 and go 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 and i had planned that turning 65 that I'd retire, yeah, but I kind of was worried that I wouldn't know what am I going to do with myself if I'm not working. And so gotcha. I was open to all kinds of different input at the time. I've now become a bit more, you know, <laughs> think more about what I'm going to say yes to. I'll put it that way. So, um, <laughs> you know, when, when you called, and I'll never forget, you told me what you were going to do, which was build a hypersonic transport airplane. And I couldn't help it, but I sort of chuckled when you said that. I'm like, what? You know, and uh, mm -hmm. but then you immediately pivoted to 
how you're going to get there and, and the path you're going to take. And I thought, okay, this actually makes some sense. And then, uh, to be honest, one of the big selling points was when we had our first meeting and I met these two gentlemen, I'm like, okay, you got, you have serious people on your team. So, uh, so it's, that, that's kind of my, you know, back in time with, uh, first connecting with you. Yeah. And you know, I got the outreach on LinkedIn and your predatory instincts, AJ, are, are clearly <laughs> relatively evolved because I, now for the we're, first, we're going we're to edit that part out <laughs> for the first time. Um, well, perhaps hunting and gathering. <laughs> How's that? Um, this is the first time I've put together that we had all just come out of our previous case because I left USGIF at the end of calendar year 18. And I think I must have heard from you in February ish of 19. And and so, you know, my first thing I think I said to you was when we spoke, um, I don't know anything about hypersonics. What I know about startups is that I've watched Silicon Valley mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how I can help you, but I'm very interested. And then and I think. I think in my case, you dropped their names and then that, that was, well, I would come help you just to be in the room with them. So I, 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 I remember since learned that that's not a good criteria. <laughs> well, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but, uh, it was just impressive to me. Um, the way you were thinking about things, the way you enlightened me as to the homework you'd done as to what you believed I could do for you. And, 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 and that was very helpful, the framing that you provided, not just of the vision for the company, but, but why you stalked me <laughs> uh, and, and what you thought I could contribute. Such great comments. Too bad it's all gonna be cut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my main takeaway here is badassery, and then, hey, oh, Rob's joining, and then, oh, Rob and Rob are joining, and then that's, that, yeah. that's it, that's all it takes. Cool. But, but you know, AJ, it's, uh, those kinds of methods are used very often, but it's not often that the person using them backs it up. Like you show up and you heard, well, so-and-so is going to be involved. And then you come and, and they're not, <laughs> no, they, they so backed out. They, they couldn't make out. it. They, they had a conflict. Yeah, exactly. In case you haven't noticed, I'm very bad at poker. So <laughs> just see what you see is what you get. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, you guys have, have been with the company, um, not just as advisors, but but as some of our very first investors, like literally the first checks that went into the Hermes bank account. Uh, I think there's there's one person who beat you, um, but, uh, you know, you guys were, were right there um, as things were kind of uh, coming together around the first fundraise and, and everything. This would have been the, the early part of, of 2019. Um, so, you know, it was literally four of us in the, in the basement at the time. Um, what what have you guys observed uh, over the past four and a half years as, as you've seen this company you know leave a basement and build a factory? Um, what what have you seen? Well, I'd like to add one thing to your comment about our early checks because it's been a, it was a defining moment for me again professionally mm -hmm. uh, because what I said to you was I don't really understand what a cap table is. <laughs> I don't know how all this works. I don't have a great deal of money, but I feel like I want to have skin in the game. My very, after our first meeting, that was the impetus for me wanting to write a check was these guys are all in. These founders have pushed kind of everything to the center of the table. I visit, I add what I can, but then I go away. And I, and I, I wanted to have skin in the game with you even if it was modest. And I remember talking to you about what, what is a check that isn't stupidly low, right? Um, and, and that became my thesis for my, all my future and almost all my future investing. So in any case where I believe in the team and believe in the tech and want to have my name and my reputation associated with them and believe I can help them, then I want, I want to write a check. And I, and I want to be part of it. And then when someone pointed out one day, oh, you're an angel investor, I, 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 I never <laughs> thought of it that way. Mm -hmm. What I thought was I was putting in earnest money with founders who in turn believed in me and believed that I could help them. So it all starts here. It all starts with us 
Um, and I and I share that to this day when I'm talking to young founding teams, I say, you know, I don't think it's a requirement. But if I was briefing that slide, you know, of the people's heads with flags behind them and as their advisors, I'd want to say my last sentence before going to the next slide would be, and they're all invested. Next slide, because I think it would be incredibly powerful. Um, so anyway, that that moment, that time was really formative and important for me and, 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 and I appreciate it. You know, I want to go off of that a little bit. Uh, like Rob and Rob, did you, was that kind of a similar moment for, for you guys coming out of, um, you know, decades, decades careers and kind of switching gears to what was next? Uh, absolutely. I never, never projected forward that I would become an angel investor. And that, that was, you know, just, no, that's, that's not, for people like me, like, you know what I mean? And, but, but it is that you, you, you find that, that, uh, there's a lot of value you can bring and even more so when you're, when you're invested, when you have that skin in the game. So, yeah, Keith, Keith said it extremely well. He actually took the words right out of my mouth. I was going to say skin in the game. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I could do justice to being an advisor for you if I didn't believe in you. And part of believing is putting some resources on the table. Um, you know, I'm not sure my financial advisor thought it was a great idea, but, uh, you know, <laughs> right there, more conservative with your, your wealth and your retirement, you know, but, uh, seriously, it was like, okay, you know, I, I asked the same question about, well, what, what's a reasonable, you know, investment to make. And, uh, you gave good guidance and, uh, and so uh, I'm sure my financial advisor's not worried and staying up nights about that. But uh, the uh, the thing that I, I've found remarkable, though, is since putting that, uh, that investment in the game, since coming on board and being part of this team, and as Key said, you know, we're, we're in and out. We're not here day to day uh, seeing what you're accomplishing. But as we, we've come back over, you know, months and years now, it's really incredible how dramatic uh, the change has been from the beginning until here we sit in your factory where you're gonna actually produce a hypersonic aircraft. And, you know, we first met, we were talking about today when we, we drove out here that Oh, this is where we stayed when we met with you the first time. And oh, yeah. I don't think Keith will ever forget that. I can't remember if it was the first visit or the second visit where we somehow put you in an NBC Suites that was under construction. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and, you know, I don't remember exactly, but, uh, you know, you kind of had a bunch of PowerPoint charts, right? That's about it. And Not, uh, e not even that many. Yeah, not that many. Um, you know, you probably didn't even have very many good computers to run those PowerPoint charts at the time. You're just oh no, we we had we had one good computer that could run CFD okay. at the time. There that we go. Yeah, there we go. So that's yep. where you started, <laughs> and um, you know the the pace of uh, you know change and and where you've gotten is what's to me really remarkable because you know anybody can eventually get there but it's get there fast. It, speed is so critical to getting to the market. And I think that's what's, um, what's really differentiates you and Hermius is that focus on making it happen now and, uh, and not waiting. So I'm a big fan of that. And you've done a, done a super job. So Rob has suggested that apparently it's all about speed. <laughs> as it turns out i i've said those words before but you know and talking about hypersonics it, you know all about speed and kind of give the little measures of what's hypersonic mean and how you know that type of thing but i i've quickly pivoted to it's the speed of development that's really critical and uh and we uh you know we don't necessarily have that across the board with some of the uh moonshots you will of, of what the nation's trying to do you know you've got to if you i'm a believer that if you put the focus on hitting a commitment at at a given time uh and that time being an aggressive uh milestone that you're trying to hit that a lot of the rest of the stuff you know lines up people line up uh resources line up you know, innovation lines up, 
appropriate amount of risk taking, you know, so, so I'm, I'm a fan of speed. What's, you, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I maybe wanted to ask a little bit more, more broadly. So pace or speed in, in the aircraft development world uh, in the past couple of decades arguably has not been what it was in, let's say, the 50s and 60s. Um, and th- this is something that, you know, we here at Hermes are, are very much keen on, on changing, you know, putting out a new aircraft at least once a year. It's not something that's been done in a long time. Um, why do you all think that is? And, and you, know, you know, Rob, I, I look to you from uh, you know, maybe a Skunk Works perspective, like what has changed? Um, you know, Rob, I think from uh, the the new space world, we have kind of seen that pace of development. So maybe some things that have changed there. And then, you know, Keith on the the geospatial side, um, you know, from a satellite perspective, again, you know, we we have seen that pace change. So, rockets, yes; satellites, yes; airplanes, no. Why? All looking at the airplane guy. Are you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I have actually thought a lot about this being at Skunk Works. You know, and when I first. Uh, went out there in 2012 into, into Palmdale and uh, you know I spent a lot of years uh, already in the Lockheed and the airplane company and I kind of went back to why is the skunk work special and a lot of it was you know if you think back to World War II when the skunk works began built the first jet fighter in the United States that was what Kelly Johnson uh, initially start with you, you guys know the story. I'm sure most of your, we have audience. a conference room named after it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Very good. You know, and he came back from signing this deal at, uh, at, at, uh, in Dayton and, you know, going to build this, this fighter jet and Lockheed was full built building bombers for the war at the time. And that's when Kelly was like, we're, we're going to put this small group of people out at the, at the periphery of uh, the the facility, uh, you know, had to put up a circus tent to to actually build the airplane because there was no place in the in the site to uh, to build the jet. And he, you know, scoured a few people, the, the best people, small group, and made it happen. Beat the commitment that he he gave to the Army Air Corps at the time to to build the jet. And, um, and that's kind of the culture. That's when Skunk Works began. So it was back to this speed issue. You know, we're going to build a, a first jet fighter in 180 days. And he beat that by 20%. And that's, I think, more important than thinking about, oh, how much is this going to cost? Well, as we all know, time is money. So go fast and you'll, you'll cover a lot of the, uh, the, the cost issues that that we face with programs today but to back to your question of why you know i do think it's important to remember that at the time we were in the middle of world war ii a lot of a lot of people were dying across the globe large numbers and there was certainly a willingness at the time to take take risk like okay we're going to put a pilot in that cockpit and it's it's a dangerous mission because we haven't we didn't do all the testing that we do today you know it's not it's still dangerous obviously to be a test pilot there's danger involved in it but we have gone through tremendous amount of risk reduction by the time we actually fly the airplane and put a man or woman in the cockpit so um I think the risk element of it is is a big factor, um, and I think that's what we have to do to kind of recover some of that aggressiveness. Is find a better balance on risk, and you know, there's a lot of personal risks that people now have involved. Like if if something fails and it's in my camp, mm-hmm. I'm going to be held accountable, and and typically that being held accountable is is you know got some downside ramifications on people's careers so you just across the board and then you build that across the industry and the customer in the government case and you've just created a fairly large bureaucracy that is going to be risk averse and 
anyway, I could go on and on, but I, I think that's, that's kind of the, one of the key issues that needs to be addressed is how do we ex get to an acceptable level of risk that allows us to go fast. How, how, how have you seen that kind of happen in the commercial space world, more specifically on the long st launch side? Well, uh, following up on Rob's point, that, that's, that risk aversion becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the aircraft development slows down, talent development mm -hmm. slows down, and so then your talent density in the whole industry just kind of falls off. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I, it, there's talented people in all, all these organizations, and there's, there's pockets, but the experience building a, you know, a full product life cycle, an aircraft, from beginning to end. Um, we saw this at, at NASA and the space programs where sp program after program got canceled in the in the 80s and 90s, the replacement for the space shuttle. Uh, and then you had, you know, um, new companies start like Blue Origin and SpaceX. Um, we had a we had a false start in the 90s with Kessler, Kelly Space, you know, Rotary Rocket, all these companies that were built to serve the new telecom constellations that, you know, didn't all happen. Um, orbital, would, orbital sciences did okay. Orbital sciences did okay. Yeah, for sure. And orbital sciences was developed for a slightly different purpose. And uh, they did actually more than okay, mm -hmm. you know, you know, d delivered, you know, a lot of value, um, multi-billion dollar company. Um, but I was at Kistler for six years. Um, uh, and as, as, uh, we got into Blue Origin, you, you had private investment coming in, you had some NASA starting the, the famous COTS program, which really, you know, initiated some new development. Um, and then you had, and then you started to see private, you know, venture capital come in because you saw a few successes. And when I started at Blue Origin, there was no success stories in private space, except for orbital sciences. And, and Beale Aerospace had just cratered. Like mm -hmm. it was uh, 200 people. It went, you know, you know, gangbusters. And then it was, was shut down. So there was a, lo a, a, a group of people in the industry that were interested in taking a risk that had been burned and had heard stories of people who had been burned and they didn't want to go, go there. So over this period from, you know, 2005 to 2015, you had a big ramp up in, you know, hundreds at Blue Origin, thousands at SpaceX who had gone off and done things. And, and you start to see, oh, well, OK, well, we can start to chip away at these things that people thought were impossible, like reusable launch vehicles. And, and NASA said, we did that on shuttle. It didn't work. So go try something else. Um, we thought we thought differently. And then luckily, between Blue Origin and SpaceX, you see you know, reusability being demonstrated on, you know, you know, especially on the SpaceX side routinely. And uh, um, that's why when, when you called Mach 5 airplane, hell yeah, you know, like private funding, you know, yeah, if we're going to wait for the government, maybe, maybe not so much, but if we're going to use, you know, private funding and government to, to go advance this, it's, it's not like this is a, um, impossible task this is a very doable thing especially the approach that you guys that you that, that hermes is taking so mm -hmm. keith what do you think enabled a much faster pace of development in the satellite community yeah the the satellite community so I, you know obviously remote sensing is sort of my my thing starts with a culture of innovation a, a, an organization operating in the shadows Right now, now uh, I remember the days where we weren't allowed to say National Reconnaissance Office, actually. Uh, but the, the NRO is sort of operating tucked up under NASA in some ways uh, and the remarkable history there. So it starts with a culture that is grounded in innovation, grounded in speed, grounded in doing things people hadn't done before and things people didn't think necessarily were possible, driven by um, the tension of the of the cold war uh which where the stakes were very high uh and and then it and then it moves into this period of going from risk management to risk aversion and that's when things slow down people don't want to take risk then to rob's point organizations don't want to take risk then people are brought up in cultures that are risk averse and it and it it's it's uh 
it's brutal. It's, it's and 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 it was the way we've come back out of that uh, were some small programs in the government where risk were, was encouraged, and then a culture that grew up outside people either who had been the government been in the government and gone out uh, or who had never been in the government that started doing it on the commercial side driven by um, commercial best practices and the ability to learn quickly and iterate quickly and develop in a, a spiral way and, and so in that that's where the in the, certainly the remote sensing the and, and the imaging world specifically starts with the heritage of moving quickly moves into a slower period some innovation returns inside the government while a bunch of it then is seeded and starts to heat up outside the government and i think it's actually a, it's it's a decently healthy balance now um, if anything the government feels pressured i would argue by the speed at which the commercial world can execute um, and f forces them to think differently about things so given given all of that, given these these three areas, why are airplanes kind of the last one to catch up in terms of speed of development? I mean, these you know, Rob knows more about this. Well, forgotten more about this than I know. <laughs> um, I, I think it has at least something to do with um, that pilot and and people being on aircraft. Um, you know, in the in the intelligence world. The risk one is taking in human intelligence is very, very different than you're taking in signals intelligence, you know, traditional signals intelligence, geospatial intelligence, et cetera. When there is a human on the line, um, it's it's a different it's a different calculation, and there's just a different bar, um, and 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 so that that's the thing that jumps into my mind about why why are airplanes different? Yeah, that's, I was going to say the same thing. I think. Certainly in commercial transportation, which is where you're heading, you've got to have that level of assurance for your for the passengers that you're going to arrive safely. Yeah. And uh, so it's going to take, you know, there's no shortcutting on that, you know. So um, when we talk about risk, we're going to we're going to drive down the risk to the point that we have that. 99.9% .9 confidence, you know, kind of number that that we currently experience with commercial transportation. It's a little bit different, potentially, on the uh, military side. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I say potentially different. It's really not. <laughs> you know, we still have that there, same... There are definitely still lives on the line, be there one in the cockpit or not. Right, right. So I think, you know, as long as we hit... And, I don't know, even in the unmanned arena mm -hmm. that we see it a lot differently, though. It's still still the same level of, of acceptance of risk that comes into play. And uh, so, I, you know, I think there's a couple other elements we didn't really speak about that, on, at least on the military side, that have resulted in things uh, being slower. And one of them is requirements growth and you know i mean you know we we contract for a particular solution and then all through the development there's change and you know everybody has a better idea on how to do something and and that that's time and money that there's cost and and it's going to extend the development time and you know that was one of the principles that kelly johnson had is you know we're building this airplane now it doesn't mean there aren't changes that have to be made along the way, but they're not in self-inflicted, if you will, by, I got a better idea. It's, uh, we can't solve this problem with this way, so we'll, we'll make a change. But it's not, you know, give me a, give me a better, you know, cooler. I want an airplane. Thing. No, I want a boat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, Rob, how do you think NASA got that right with the commercial orbital transportation services and the follow-on commercial crew? The kind of requirements piece and, and how NASA thought about working with private industry. Yeah, I think, um, well, with COTS, you know, commercial cargo started out as a side, a sideline. You know, it was, uh, we have a, a lot of cargo we want to send to the ISS. 
Uh, at first, some of those visiting vehicles were going to come from international partners, the Japanese, the Europeans. Um, and we want to create two or more U.S. You know, uh, cargo carriers. Uh, the first awards went to SpaceX and Kistler Aerospace. Um, Kistler uh, dropped out um, and, and NASA brought in Northrop Grumman uh, with the Cygnus. Um, I think the key to success of that was just uh, it, it was it was like a it was a, it was not like the mainline program. It wasn't Artemis. It was sort of on the side. It had a program manager who was committed to it and he had enough support to go get it done. Um, he made the right decision in cutting Kistler out when they weren't performing. Uh, and I'm a Kistler alum and that hurt. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, but to, to hear about that was 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 too bad. But uh, um, both SpaceX and Northrop put the resources on it to 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 build the vehicles. Um, I, I think commercial crew was a completely different animal. Like people talk about those in the same sentence, but once you put that human on board, um, a lot of folks, first there was disbelief. I don't think we're gonna really do this, but within NASA, but 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 when it became clear that they were gonna do it, the requirements piled up. And uh, when you look at the, the, you know, the number of requirements that were applied to commercial crew versus space shuttle, are different, but not orders of magnitude different. Um, the number of requirements applied to cargo were orders of magnitude different. It was a much simpler system to develop, um, and uh, um, and that gave both, you know, SpaceX and Northrop Grumman an opportunity to build, you know, commercial capability that could, you know, in the future apply to commercial space stations. So, um, so what I think is, you know. I don't see a lot of people talking about is taking those two models and then applying them to CLIPS, commercial lunar landers. Um, it's a slightly different contracting method. It's an IDIQ, but you're, you're spreading money out to multiple companies, giving them awards that they can use to build a base, build a vehicle, demonstrate a vehicle, get multiple shots on goal to land a lander on the moon. Um, or similar model with XEVAS commercial spacesuits, um, and similar but different model with commercial um, space stations, the low Earth orbit destinations. So, you see these these similar models being used, and then DOE's picked it up now with Fusion, um, and and we hope that you know the DoD will pick it up with, you know. Yeah. So yeah. do do you yeah. guys think that is a viable path for the DoD to take um, uh, a COTS type model for? Uh, I'll say, modern is solving a modernization challenge. So you know, NASA had one. You know, the space shuttle needed to be modernized. Mm -hmm. uh, the DoD has fourteen hypersonics, being being one of them. Um, do you see that model uh, working in the DoD or or intelligence community? I mean, we've seen it in the intelligence community as far as you know commercial imagery goes. Um, I think the the DoD is still. Uh, I don't know that it's been demonstrated quite yet. Okay. I think the potential is there. DOD is absolutely struggling to figure out pathways forward uh, for innovation, right? Uh, we, we've developed now what many of us refer to as the innovation bureaucracy, right? <laughs> that is this Gordian knot that's wrapped around the FAR and DFARS. So, so it's not just that you had to figure that part out, which was a challenge in the past. Now you got to make your way through this this innovation bureaucracy. It is it is almost all being done with good intent, with the idea of doing things faster and doing things in a way that's more efficient. Uh, you know, on with respect to resources. But but I think there are going to they are going to get to the idea uh, of commercial wholly partially uh, as solutions and you know look I, I, th I think we're sitting in a factory where that is proving itself out in real time and and so um, we believe collectively I, I think that this is this is where we're headed because your vision uh, your founding team's vision from day one 
was sort of uh, proverbially skate to where that puck's going to be and prove that that discussion, that that supposition, that doing things public, private um, could work in a, in a DOD context as part of your overall roadmap. So I, I believe it's going to happen and I believe it's happening right here. Yeah, the, the, the COTS model, the, the C is commercial. So you got there's got to be skin in the game. The, the private mm -hmm. company needs to bring, bring money. The government is one of many customers and the government needs to see that there is a future commercial application for what they're doing. If there's no future commercial application for hypersonics, then the model's not going to work. Um, what Hermes was founded on is eventually there is a commercial application of hypersonics, and and uh, um, and I still believe in the long run that that is you know that that's viable. Um, so the government jump starting that, advancing the industrial base, advancing the talent base, um, and making that future commercial um, business case more real is is it should be the objective of whatever future hypersonics COTS program there is. So. Yeah. Oops, sorry. No, no. Well said. <laughs> yeah. They're a lot more concise than I am, so I'm, we'll stop there. <laughs> they did well. Yeah, I, I think the the key difference or challenge in you know these defense technology spaces, um, at least at least some of them, uh, there there isn't as much of a parallelization of defense and commercial uh, applications uh, as there are in others. So space launch, clearly, you know, you can build one rocket that's flying commercial missions and flying government missions. Um, with hypersonics, the commercial applications don't really come in until you get to flying people. Um, yes, there's some cargo things, and, and yes, there are some flight test things, flight test, you know, things as a, as a service. Um, but at the end of the day, like it's primarily DoD, uh, the the defense industrial base, and, and our allied partners that are leveraging those you know, commercial uh, commercial services. Um, but it's really a like defense than commercial in, in this space, which I think makes it a little bit different. Um, but I think the model still works um, because it goes back to the, the first point that you, that you brought up, Rob, which is skin in the game, right? The, you know, the DoD does not have enough money, which is like a crazy thing to say with an organization with a you know almost $900 billion budget. Um, the DoD doesn't have enough money to modernize all of those 14 uh, you know, technology areas. Um, doing business the way business has traditionally been done with the department. Um, it really needs to leverage uh, development that's happening elsewhere and that's being funded elsewhere. And I think that's part of why you're seeing so much more integration between uh, Silicon Valley uh, and Washington, D.C., you know, be it the Pentagon um, or uh, you know, other, um, uh, other parts of the U.S. government, um, because there's a realization that like, we are in a you know, global geopolitical situation, um, a you know, techno-economic competition with China um, in which, like, the U.S. government in and of itself uh, is, like, it's, it's, it's tough for that to drive the level of innovation that's necessary to, you know, lead in, in that type of competition. It really needs to be a partnership with, with industry. And, I mean, we've seen industry leading in R&D in, in a wide range of different areas. I mean, we just talked about launch satellites um, and, you know, Air aircraft now is certainly a, an air, and not just in high speed aircraft, we're seeing it in uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing, um, uh, alternative fuels, all sorts of other things around aviation. Um, you know, that partnership is, is how we win. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, very much look forward to the next couple of years as we, you know, fight it out. Um, as we kind of wrap up a little bit here, um, um, you know, you know, we're five ish years in, into the company here. Uh, what do you guys, where do you guys think we'll be in five years? So when we sit down here, I'll have more gray hairs in, uh, in 2028, that's for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, where, where do you guys think we'll be? You know, I go back to, uh, what I said when you called me up on the phone the first time and I, you told me what you were going to do and I chuckled, right? <laughs> and I've been proven wrong. There was no reason to chuckle. You, uh, have, have met your and probably exceeded your initial goals i mean some of what we talked about yesterday in our meeting you know you've you talked about well we've lost a few months here or there and uh i mean that's that's nothing and uh and uh 
path you're trying to take here. So I, I think you're going to be right where you said, if not ahead of where you're going to be in, in five years um, from now. And I think we're, we're going to see operational hypersonic vehicles out there that are making a difference uh, and for, for the nation. And they're going to prove a point to our competitors across the globe. And uh, I think that's going to be very important. It's going to say that we have the capability in the United States to set an aggressive goal and to achieve it. And I think that's where, we'll be, where you'll be at one of the one of those who have really made that happen uh, to to exceed a goal that we set. Yeah, when when I joined, I think the. All the, all the news was about how far behind we are in hypersonics. And I think in, in five years, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about how we, how we made up that ground. And, and uh, uh, I think that the progress is remarkable. I think there's a lot of, a lot of good things going on in the industry and, and great signals. So very optimistic. So. Yeah, look, I'm a New Yorker, right? The glass is half empty. Don't you live in New Jersey now? <laughs> oh, wow. <so> that's just... <laughs> <laughs> you had to do that. So, um, and uh, I'll just keep going. He, so, he is actually from New York. We're actually from like right. literally the same yes. little town. That's true. Little town. Yeah. Little-ish. Little-ish. Um, and, and so I am normally a, a pessimist. Um, and what I've seen happen here, the transformation, and, and feel so fortunate, truly, AJ, to be part of this. Um, I consider myself just lucky to have gotten that outreach on LinkedIn uh, and to have had the conversation we've had and to contribute in whatever small way I've been able uh, to do. Uh, it's the things that I've been able to offer. Um, but, but the transformation that's occurred here from a vision to a reality, the bold, aggressive schedule that you had uh, that is, you know, we are generally uh, tracking, the culture that you have built of we are uh, we are an, we are an aircraft company. We are not doing it the way others have done it. Uh, we are taking the best we can see of, of different pieces and putting it together, building on the experience that you and your extended team now have. The people that are being attracted to this company because of that culture and because of that vision um, makes it very difficult for me to be pessimistic uh, and quite the opposite. The opportunity here is remarkable and every time we have the privilege of coming here uh, and walking this floor and and meeting people on your team and seeing the dedication and commitment in their eyes and understanding uh, just looking at some of their resumes the things they've done before they got here and how they're bringing that with them um, it's eye-watering and um, inspiring and I, I couldn't be more excited and confident uh, about what's going to happen here uh, and in other places where you're going to grow. All right. Well, let's go. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's go. We got work to do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, um, gentlemen, it's been a, been a pleasure. Um, not just this conversation, but, uh, you know, you, Keith, you speak about having a privilege of, of being here. We have the privilege of uh, your support, um, your guidance, uh, your advice, um, your calling us out on our bullshit <laughs> when we have it um and uh you know o over the past four years it, it really has been formative uh, not just for the company as a whole but i think for you know the, the four of us founders as as individuals as engineers as professionals as leaders um you know having having had your experience to draw on has has been really helpful and formative as, as we've tried to figure out what our jobs are every day so that's uh yeah it's been great so Looking forward to sitting down again. Hopefully not five years from now, but uh, hopefully before. I'm hoping to be here five years from now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Great. Thanks very much, Thank AJ. Thank you, AJ. Thanks. Thanks.